Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jeff Ambrosa. I'm part of the Global Health Technologies Group at RTI, and it's uh, my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, who's my former colleague, Dr. Brian Barrage, who is currently the Associate Director of the National Toxicology Program at NIEHS. Right, right here in RTP. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on Brian. He studied animal science at the University of Arkansas as an undergraduate. He went to veterinary school at Oklahoma State. Afterwards, he went to Texas A&M for his PhD research and vet, uh, residence in veterinary pathology. He also did some postdoctoral research in cardiovascular health at the Texas Heart Institute and Brian is a board-certified veterinary pathologist. Um, he also has 17 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry, and that's where I met Brian. First, he was at Lilly, and then later at uh, GlaxoSmithKline right here in RTP in uh, preclinical safety assessment and also in animal science. Um, Brian was known in our department for being a very personable, knowledgeable and innovative scientists. He led efforts to incorporate new scientific techniques into traditional toxicology studies and with a focus on cardiovascular toxicology. In his current position, Brian is also working on utilizing mod modern science to improve human health risk assessment. And today his talk will highlight some of these efforts. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Brian Barrage to RTI. I don't know where Jeff came up with some of that stuff, but I appreciate the, uh, the intro. Um, two, I really appreciate this invitation to come and share with you all some of the conversations that we're having at NTP and, and uh, some of the ideas that, uh, that we've got that, that I've sort of brought from my experiences in pharma. Um, and I really appreciate the fact that uh, you all are getting fed, which significantly lowers the pressure on me to, uh, to carry the entertainment value in this particular gathering. So that's a, that's a really good thing. So as Jeff said, um, I'm the Associate Director of the National Toxicology Program. I have been in that position for all of like seven and a half months, so I'm still drinking from a rather large fire hose and learning a complete, completely different area um, of toxicology. But fortunately, some of the fundamentals uh, at the National Toxicology Program that uh, we commonly practiced in, in pharma are similar enough that, that I feel like that that I can at least pretend to understand what's really happening there. But best of all, it's an opportunity for me to, to sort of uh, really try to do some things that, that I uh, had built an interest in doing um, while I was in pharma. So that's part of what I'm going to share with you uh, today. So just by way of outline, I'm going to give you some sense of why I left pharma. You know, nobody was kicking me to the curb. You know, it was sort of a voluntary move. And pharma, that's kind of unusual these days to actually voluntarily get to, to leave. So. You know, I, uh, this was a, a choice on my part, and I want to give you some insights into why I made that choice. Um, talk a little bit about the challenges that the National Toxicology Program um, has and, and some of the gaps that, that I feel like that we have in the way we approach the business and, and actually have an opportunity to do something about. Um, give you some early insights into the, kind of the strategic discussions that, that we're having to, to ultimately take on some of those challenges and fill some of those gaps. And then talk a little bit about what I think is an interesting intersection of, of need and, and opportunity and actually represents kind of an application of some of the principles that I'll talk through in, in this presentation. So for starters, um, you know, what attracted me to the National Toxicology Program? So even when I was in pharma, I'm just kind of driven by this notion of public health and actually doing something meaningful to help people. The reality of it is, and I tell people this all the time, my daughter is a, is a nurse at UNC Chapel Hill. On an individual patient basis, she has more impact than I'll ever have. So this is my attempt to actually turn whatever skills that I have into something that I think is, is meaningful um, in the arena of public health. And so uh, fundamentally, the National Toxicology Program is a, is a public health um, endeavor. It just happens to be one that's focused on toxicology, and, and they have a strength in, in applying 
um, fairly contemporary tools in addition to building those tools. So I'm, I'm here, I'm at the NTP because I believe in the mission and it's an extension of, of the things that I believe in that, that um, I think we're also part of our efforts in pharma. Uh, from a primary aims perspective, um, the, the program uh, fundamentally generates scientific, in particular toxicologic data that ultimately enables people to make decisions, the public and also regulators and policymakers. In addition to that, it has a fundamental component of their mission that involves the development of novel approaches. And again, that's, the, that's one area that I'm particularly interested in, leveraging the rapid advances in, in technology and data and knowledge and all those kinds of things. A big part of, of our business, and this is a, a fundamental change for me, is the communication stuff, right? So in farm, it was all about not letting the other guy know what you were doing. But at the NTP, it's all about letting everybody know what we're doing. And I really like that, that transparency. Now that transparency comes at a cost, and I've come to discover in my short seven and a half months that not everybody agrees with what you do. And so sometimes you're a target for um, criticism if folks feel like that you didn't do something that aligned to the way they were thinking about things. So the communication part of our business is really, really important, and that's something that I've grown to, to have an appreciation for. And, and in fact, I think that's a, an interesting challenge and, and, and a worthy one to take on because ultimately, the things that we do, if nobody knows about them, they, they ultimately lose their, their potential for impact. And so that's a fundamental difference between uh, the way we worked in pharma and the way the National Toxicology Program functions. The other thing that's interesting to me about um, NTP, and I've just recognized that I got screens all over the place, so I don't have to keep looking back here and not look at you all, so apologies for that. But the other thing that's attracted me about NTP, and this is something that, that, that uh, was part of pharma, is this team science collaborative approach, right? So within pharma, not only did we collaborate across disciplines within the organization, but also pharma increasingly, and this is something that I think progressed throughout my 17-year career, um, increasingly partnered with each other to take on uh, problems that were shared amongst organizations. So I really like the collaborative team science kind of approach to uh, taking on challenges. And that is codified in the NTP in that the, the National Toxicology Program is actually an interagency uh, collaboration between the NIH in the context of NIEHS and the division of the NTP, which is the part of it that I lead, CDC with NIOSH and, and FDA. And so um, it is, by structure, a, uh, a collaborative effort, but there's also lots of organizations that we also are involved in um, at even the global level um, uh, in the way we approach the way we do the business. So I really like that, that way of working. The other thing about NTP, and I, I mentioned to you uh, the transparency part of it, there's lots of products, right? So there's lots of ways that we communicate the things that, uh, that the NTP does. And again, it's all about being able to get this out in usable form so that folks who need to use this information can use it either, again, for personal decision making or for regulatory decision making policy, all of those kinds of things. So it's completely transparent. Everything that we do is put in the, um, in the public space. And in fact, there's a huge infrastructure that's ultimately designed to facilitate that. The NTP, because of its 40-year history, this is our 40th uh, anniversary year, so it was a good time for me to kind of come into the organization, has developed uh, some pretty significant core strengths in all the places that you would expect a toxicology organization to have strength, right? So the, the kinds of uh, studies that we do, and in particular the in vivo studies. But increasingly, it's become less of a, a, an effort focused on two-year cancer studies and, and actually encompassed a much broader array of, of uh, toxicology interests, including repro and immunotox and all those kinds of things. It's also built um, over the last several years a significant capability around in vitro modeling and also computational modeling. So it is a, it is a, a toxicology effort that represents the full breadth of things that you would expect in a, in a safety hazard characterization kind of an organization and has done, a, I think, a pretty good job of keeping up with the uh, technology and the needs. A thing that I think distinguishes the NTP from uh, a lot of um, organizations is the fact that a lot of toxicology organizations, is they take on the really, really hard stuff, right? So this is not just turn the crank kind of studies, which is, you could have argued that the two-year bioassays were sort of turn the crank kind of studies. But increasingly, they've moved towards things that are much more complicated than that. So dealing with mixtures and herbals and, and, environment, and um, industrial chemicals and the full breadth, even pharmaceuticals to some degree. So 
they, they, they deal with the full spectrum of agents that we worry about in, in our environment, and they take on the tough stuff. So that's a, a significant part of, of the way they do their business. So this is the bit, though, that I was really, really interested in, and, and it's something that in my 17 years of, of pharma, I, I have come to appreciate the challenge of doing this, this, this and, um, meeting this vision, right? So this is a vision that the NTP um, articulated in 2004, right? So it's got a little age on it. But it is a vision that is shared in the community. And everybody recognizes that despite the fact that, that we have a history of, of using animal studies to characterize hazards and, and do safety assessment because of its sort of phenotypic outcomes, the reality of it is, is we, can't, we can't continue to do animal studies to, to cover the full breadth of, of, um, of uh, things that, that we're concerned about. So we really have to get to a different place. There's also some expectations about how we use the information that we generate. So I'm really interested in how we facilitate this evolution from what traditionally has been an observational science to one that is more predictive. And that means being able to use novel approaches and novel kinds of data to be able to understand um, what uh, in vivo or human outcomes of the kinds of things that we describe um, would be. So that's the thing that predominantly attracted me to the National Toxicology Program. So here's why I should never have taken on this role. So I felt like that, you know, coming from pharma, I said, well, I know, I know about something about toxicology and safety assessment, right? I've been doing that for 17 years. But I underappreciated the difference between pharmaceutical safety and environmental safety or toxicology. And the, the breadth of the, of the challenge here and the breadth of the potential for impact, right? So... You know, even though we've become sort of a genomic biased uh, biomedical research community, the ra reality of it is, and, and everybody, I think most people recognize, maybe people other than Francis, but most people recognize that the environment is probably far more influential in disease, initiation and progression of disease, than genetics. And in fact, the real challenge is understanding the interaction between environment and genetics and how that ultimately initiates and progresses and facilitates chronic disease. And so the, the, the global impact of environment on disease in general is, is incredible. When you start to recognize with reports like this from the CDC and you look at how many different things are being monitored in, um, in human samples and the number of chemicals that are measurable in our biological samples, it's incredible to recognize how much uh, potential we have for the exposures. You think about the interaction between the things that we're exposed to and, and our individual biology, and you get into to really, really complex kinds of equations. You put that in the context of the regulatory context that we also work in, right? Somebody's got to turn that, that understanding, that, that knowledge, into policies and regulations that ultimately have some aim in, in trying to protect um, human health, and it gets really, really hard. So a smart guy would have stayed in pharma where we knew exactly what we were giving people for how long and there was actually a risk-benefit equation to be had there because most of the stuff that we deal with is not intended to have any biological effect and so there's not much in the way of the benefit part of that equation. It's really all about risk if you take out the sort of the uh, economic uh, part of that equation. So. If I had thought this through better, I'd still be working for GSK, but I didn't, so I am where I am. So now that I am here, and I'm learning a lot, and again, I've, I've confessed to you about the, uh, the fire hose thing, um, uh, there are challenges, and so um, I'm interested in taking on those challenges. And so as I mentioned, we couldn't possibly animal study our way out of, uh, of the challenges that we've got for the breadth of things that we're really concerned about. Uh, that we we ought to know uh, understand better um, around how to protect folks. I think you all recognize that um, there's also a growing interest um, and concern about the the, the the animal studies that we do. Uh, so there are folks who are just interested in us not using animals. And actually, I'm one of those people. I'm a veterinary pathologist for a living. I've made my living supporting animal studies, and it wouldn't bother me a bit if we saw a day when we didn't have to use them for the kinds of things that we use them uh, today. On the flip side to that, there are also people who are concerned that the animals sometimes give us the wrong answers, right? So there's the, the, the human translation kind of a thing. So there's lots of good reasons for us to be looking at ways of doing this without using animals. I think the, that said, I think we have um, 
had made considerable progress in our ability to generate very mechanistic data in very high throughput ways using lots of different assay systems. And I think that those, the, the data that we've generated from those systems has filled up a, a, an enormous number of databases. But I don't think they're sufficiently impacting our ability to make real decisions around regulation policy and even some individual decisions about how we do things. So there's a gap. And I think that gap is in our ability to take that kind of information and ultimately turn it into real decisions. And it's that gap that, that I'm really interested in. And I think there are good drivers for doing that. So even though I left pharma um, from an employment perspective, I actually have a, a significant interest in, in pharma um, and, and maintaining my, my contact. And I've, I've told you that our portfolio includes some work that we do in pharmaceuticals. So I'm interested in, in the things that we might do that have an intersection with pharma. Um, and, and in fact, I don't think that's very difficult to, to discover. I think most of you recognize that pharma has some real challenges, which is contributed to the churn that we see in, in pharma uh, throughout the industry. It takes a long time, it costs a lot of money, and essentially we fail a lot. We, I guess I gotta stop saying we because they've disowned me by now. So they fail a lot, but, but as a community, um, a lot of the, the, uh, the attempts at developing novel uh, drugs um, aren't successful, and I think everybody recognizes that. There are lots of different contributions to that. The one that, that I spent most of my time thinking about when I was in pharma was, was attrition. And within the full spectrum of ways that, that things attrit in the development uh, cycle, the one that, that I was most engaged with is, are those things that relate to safety uh, challenges or, or, or hazards, the risk part of the risk-benefit equation. This is a, a paper where a number of pharma got together, including GSK, a number of years, and they sort of compared notes on, on why things were failing. And, and one of the sort of glaring things that pops out, particularly in that, that late stage, early development stage of, of drug development, are things that fall out of development for non-clinical toxicology, right? So these are, these are drugs that get into animal studies and, and ultimately the wheels fall off. So we find out that there are liabilities associated with those drugs that we didn't know about. And it's a significant proportion of a significant proportion of the reason why drugs fail. So this is, to me, a clear need to ultimately identify ways to identify hazards of drugs before you get to animal studies. And that, to me, is in common with the challenge that we have in environmental toxicology, which is we need to find non-animal ways of understanding hazards associated with chemicals just because of the breadth of things that we need to deal with. So to me, there's an intersection there, and, and to me, that's a, that's a value proposition that I think is, is worth pursuing. So we're in the National Toxicology Program um, with using my coming into the organization as an excuse to sort of step back and look at what we do and how we do it. You know, one of the things that we've been doing is just sort of uh, aligning on, on, on key principles and making sure that we all agree that, that we are what we are and that we're going in the right direction, at least from a fundamental perspective. So this is sort of some of the very basic conversations we've been having. And we're recognizing that our role in the government and ultimately in the community is to develop data that ultimately supports um, public health impact, but ultimately enables uh, policymakers and regulators to make clear decisions. Because of our mission, not only to generate data, but also to innovate or to, to develop novel approaches, We've got that sort of twofold um, or two-pronged mission um, that, that is fundamentally what we are aiming to do. And we use the full breadth of tools that are available to us, and we're constantly interested in improving and building on those tools. And ultimately, that feeds into a, a vision that um, um, of ours to advance public health and the discipline of toxicology through the use of these innovative tools and strategies that are translatable, predictive, and timely. So I'm going to build on, um, on some of those themes as I go through the rest of this presentation. So everybody sits around the table at NTP, looks at this slide, and shakes their head yes. So we're all starting in the right place. That's a good thing. Let me talk a little bit about the, the translation piece of this, right? So when we typically think of translation, most of us think about translating into the human context, things we do on the preclinical side and, and what that ultimately means um, um, from a human perspective because we're in the business of, of public health. But actually at the NTP, we translate on a number of levels, right? So fundamentally what we do is generate scientific data and knowledge that enables uh, regulators and policymakers to do what they do. 
we have traditionally used animal studies as a fundamental surrogate or representative of the human condition to uh, give us insights into the hazards of the things that we study that allow us to have some sense of what might happen in a, in a, um, in a human. Increasingly, we're not just interested in general population kinds of effects, but as we get more successful in protecting public health and ultimately treating disease, people are, are more and more interested in the individual condition, right? So it's not just about, hey, will this do any, something to anybody, but it's, you know, what is my individual susceptibility? What does it mean to me personally? And so increasingly, we've got some precision that we brought to the field. We've also used a number of platforms, and again, as we try to become more predictive, we have increasingly used uh, biological platforms to generate um, mechanistic data that, that is generally operating down at the cellular and subcellular level, and ultimately trying to get some sense of what all would, would happen in the, the much more complex um, organism level. And that's been a real, real challenge, which is why we've got a, an aspiration that was articulated in 2004, and we're still living in a fairly traditional way of, of doing this business, despite the fact that we generate a whole lot more of that kind of data. I think that comes down into a real need to take that, that innovation, right, that ability to generate data in that way and turn it into real practice so that we're not still fundamentally using animal studies to, to make the kinds of decisions that we're making today. So translation on lots of different levels. So the other thing that we've done after we sort of agreed on our fundamental principles um, is to think about the way we do the business, right? So this is a, um, um, a, a diagram, an image that, that I came up with um, that has a number of features to it. One, there's nothing about this that's original, right? There's not a single box on here that the NTP wasn't already doing or any other toxicology organization wasn't already doing. The only thing that's different is, is that I put them in boxes with words on a slide and put arrows, right, all pointing in a direction. So that was the novelty of, of the entire operation. Two, I don't really have any um, graphic arts capabilities, so it's all just boxes and texts and the arrows that you can get on PowerPoint. So there's no creativity um, there either. The other thing that I've come to recognize, and this is a little bit disturbing, that if I had used chevrons, Instead of boxes, I would have recapitulated the pharma drug development paradigm, and that scared the devil out of me because I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so, uh, um, so brainwashed by that 17 years that I can't get past this whole idea of a, of a linear process. So let me say a couple of things in my defense. Um, I have no defense around the lack of graphic arts capability because I just don't. But what, what the intent of this was is to recognize the, the sort of the, the, the breadth of the tools that we traditionally use in the business and, and the interdependence that, that comes from using this progression. Because what generally happens in, in the NTP or any other organization is, is that a problem is presented to us and then we look around for the best tool or if it happens to be presented to somebody, they'll use the tool that they're used to using, right? So I'm a pathologist. Somebody hands me a, a problem, traditionally, well, I'd go look for it to design an animal study and turn it into histopathology, so I got a slide to read, right? Because that's, my, that's basically my hammer. So if you bring me a nail, I've got to use my hammer on it. So what I was trying to do with this, and, and it wasn't difficult to do with this particular audience, um, was to get everybody to recognize the full breadth of things. And to recognize that there is sort of a progression in the way that we take on a problem. And in fact, we, if we work this progression, then there's some opportunity to be had there. And I'll talk through that in, in just a minute. There's also the recognition that depending on what the question is, there's, there's potentially products that come, come from this. Now, in the context of drug development, the product was always going to come at the end, right? Because it was going to be the, the, um, the marketable drug. And so you had to work the entire paradigm to get to a place where you had real value. And so when the wheels fall off somewhere along that, that process, that becomes a painful experience. Well, for us, because we have a whole breadth of products and the different questions that we get, there's the potential for having a product all along this progression. So we don't have to work the entire paradigm. That said, there's value in working this paradigm um, 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 consistently, and, and that value comes from a couple of different things. One is what I like to call informed progression. And that is the notion that as you go through this process, you're sort of learning about that chemical or, or, or class of chemicals or whatever it is that you're dealing with, which allows you to become more and more hypothesis driven so that the studies you do become less standardized, check the box kinds of studies and more about 
taking on the specific problem and informing how you design that study. And, and so it's much more aligned to the uh, question that you're trying to answer. The other part of it, and I think this is the more important part of it because it gets to that fundamental gap that I shared with you, and that's around this predictivity, is, is that the more we work this paradigm, the better we understand the, the relationship or the predictivity of some of those earlier processes, the literature base, the in vitro profile, and the QSAR modeling, and those in vivo outcomes. And so if we do this deliberately, we're deliberately, deliberately, we'll constantly iteratively learn from the process and, and begin to fill that gap. Now, that lineage is a little bit incomplete. And so in particular, um, we at the NTP, and again, a lot of organizations, probably this organization, have got a fair strength in generating um, some of that bioactivity screening profile. And so we've got some high through uh, capabilities. We have increasingly built our uh, literature-based review kinds of capability with systematic reviews, those kinds of things. We use QSAR computational kinds of tools. We do a lot of mechanistic kinds of studies. Uh, we do not have a lot of capability around complex in vitro kinds of capabilities. And in fact, I think that that's a modeling gap, right? So that's a place where we can start to see that connection between mechanisms and phenotypes. And so that's a space that I'm, I'm particularly interested in as well. Before I get into that, so one of the folks at, at NTP sort of saved me from myself and tried to make this a little bit more graphically appealing. And so they put together this, this image, which, uh, again, tries to illustrate some of the principles that were in that rather boring thing that I came up with. So inherent in all of this, um, particularly in, in recognizing the, the, the gap that we've got in, in our, our predictivity um, capabilities, is, is truly wrapping our heads around and embracing the complexity of the biology and the pathobiology that we're trying to understand here, right? So in the, in the context of toxicology and safety testing, ultimately what we're trying to do is take on what we hope will be a fairly binomial challenge, right? And that is, is it normal or abnormal? And in pharma, we used to characterize the abnormal as being uh, reversible or not, or adverse or not, or monitorable or not, all that business. But, but still, it was fundamentally is it okay or not, right? So that's easy. In the approaches that we're taking increasingly using these mechanistic kinds of higher throughput kinds of things, we're actually able to recognize the, the more of the continuum of how biology really, and particularly pathobiology really plays out, right? So, so that's a progression. It doesn't go from normal to abnormal by flipping a switch. And in fact, there's a whole lot of adaptation and maladaptation that ultimately leads to the phenotypes that we recognize as being bad. Well, when you start using assay systems that allow you to measure through that entire spectrum, it gets a whole lot harder to draw a line. And so that's a challenge that, that we have to embrace and, and understand better. Another way to illustrate it is this. So you all, many of you, if you're in the safety assessment space, um, this is an example of what they call an adverse outcome pathway. Right, so adverse outcome pathways has been an attempt, um, it's an ongoing attempt, to try to understand um, sort of the pathogenesis of how bad things happen, essentially. And I like it as a pathologist because this is the way I think in the context of pathogenesis, right? Some, something activates a, a biological event and ultimately it progresses through the thresholds or the, the spectrum that I just shared with you. And it gets to a bad place and it's the bad place that we're really worried about and we want to characterize. In this particular one, this is all about the, the pathway from uh, activation of the estrogen receptor to the, the uh, event that we're most concerned about, which is the induction of breast cancer. And so it lays out all the sort of cellular events that happen in that, that cascade. Well, if you look at that, a, a fair bit of that cascade of events is normal adaptive biology, right? The stuff that happens anytime estrogen binds its receptor, which happens every day at varying levels depending on your gender and all those kinds of things and where you are in the, the circadian cycle of things. But those are things that happen every day that do, do not turn into a, patho, a pathologic effect. Well, as we increasingly uh, generate data at the sort of front end of that process, we're modeling a fair bit of stuff that just happens naturally and, and doesn't turn into pathologic events. But ultimately, we're trying to understand where things go awry, and ultimately we meet some, pass some threshold, and, and the pathobiology ultimately is initiated. And the reality of it is, is the studies that we do 
traditionally are focused on that phenotypic outcome or looking for the uh, neoplasms in the rodent studies that we do. So the real key here is understanding that that threshold from when we transition from adaption to maladaption. And that's a, 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 a fundamental place in biology that's very, very difficult to do in the context of very simple, high throughput kinds of systems. So from my perspective, this is where we've got the gap, is being able to model this transition point. Now, if you believe that, then you can start to recognize those that, that the, the, the level of biological complexity represented there and start to think through in design systems that might allow you to do that. And so that's the next thing that I want to talk a little bit about. So um, my last three years or so that I was in pharma, one of the opportunities that I had that was really um, impactful for, for, for my way of thinking about uh, things on a number of different levels was an engagement with the microphysiological systems field. And so this is the tissue on a chip, organ on a chip kind of technology that's gained a lot of uh, attention of late. And I learned a lot about one, modeling biology is one part of that, but also, and probably more importantly, about how you take on an innovative technology and try to build confidence in it and understand where you're going to use it and how you're going to use it and all those kinds of things. So I want to sort of walk you through some of that. Because that's, that's key to us filling this gap that I've just shared with you, which is a gap that I think we've got in our, our toolbox of, of modeling capabilities. So again, I just mentioned to you that microphysiological systems, depending on how you use that terminology, kind of encompasses all those complex 3D systems that, that, that folks are increasingly building. It's been a nice partnership between biomedical engineers and biologists. Some of them involve uh, uh, fluidics or, or microfluidics. But ultimately, what it's, it's, it's trying to do is to build more in vivo relevance into in vitro kinds of capabilities. So typically, they're 3D. Uh, typically, they'll involve more than one cell type. They try to bring in some dynamic properties. That's where the, some of the fluidics come in at. But the idea is to have a more complex, much more in vivo relevant uh, system. So this is gaining real traction. Well, the way I got involved with it is, is the, uh, the IQ Consortium, which is one of those pharma partnership kinds of things that, in, that has a whole spectrum of groups that work together on problems of common interest. And the uh, folks at NIH NCATS, the National Center for the Advancement of Translational Sciences, had approached us and, and said and they had, uh, um, had funded um, a, a bunch of academic investigators to build these microphysiological systems for a, different, a bunch of different organ systems. And they recognized um, that they really ought to have some pharma input into uh, these systems and how they were being built and tested and all that, because the pharma was seen as sort of a, a final or a, a, a customer of this technology. So the idea was that it would facilitate, speed up, um, make drug development cheaper. So we put together a group that, that represented about 17 different pharmaceutical companies. We had about 25 members. This group continues to, to, um, to um, work together. Obviously, I'm not part of it because it's a pharma-only group, so I had to leave it. But, but I had the chance to, to lead this group for about three years. And one of the fundamental things that we recognized when we started to uh, compare notes on this is that this is traditionally the way um, uh, our organizations would engage a novel technology, right? So everybody would see the potential promise, and everybody would start doing stuff with all the players that started to emerge as potentially providers of this capability. And so everybody was basically throwing money at, at, at the same organizations to do the same experiments, and they weren't comparing notes or, or working uh, collaboratively. So it was a terribly inefficient process. In general, none of these organizations would do enough with any one of these capability providers to actually get over the hump of confidence to, to convince themselves to, to put major investment in this. So it really was not a very efficient process. So one of the things that we intended to do as a working group was to change this paradigm by being more collaborative, by, by uh, designing experiments that were of common interest and all those kinds of things. The other part of this was is recognizing that these MPS systems didn't represent just a novel assay, but in fact could represent a novel strategy for the way we modeled things before we did animal studies. And so recognizing that, there were a number of things that we thought through um, uh, that would be um, important in all of this. One is, is the obvious one about trying to find the right balance between the complexity of the biology we felt like that we needed to give you some in vivo relevance and ultimately the throughput, and that had everything to do with where you were going to put it in pharmaceutical development. 
despite the, the intent to be more in vivo relevant, we all recognize that you are never going to recapitulate the entire human body on any kind of structure. I don't care what you call it. And so it was going to be reductionist at some level. And so there's going to be biology that just wasn't there. And so we needed to be able to account for that biology. There are always differences in, in, um, in exposures when you, start, when you deal with a, an in vitro system. And even with the, with the inclusion of uh, fluidics, it, it just wouldn't have the same kinetics. And so you need to understand that. You didn't measure the same endpoints that we would have in, a, in an in vivo study. So you needed to understand how you were going to use those different endpoints. Um, in the context of pharmaceutical development, um, you know, it's not a small molecule business anymore, and you all recognize that. You know, there's antibody-based therapies and oligonucleosides and increasingly cell and gene therapies, all that kind of stuff. So if you're going to build a modeling platform, you need to be able to account for all the potential drug modalities that, that people would be interested in because we're, all of those had to be um, assessed for their, their safety. In the environmental side, it, it's more about sort of chemical activity and binding to plastics and corrosiveness and volatility and all those kinds of things. So very um, similar kinds of problems. Ultimately, just accounting for the sort of chemistry or the biology of the, of the agents that you're putting into that system. One of the things that we recognize, too, and I put this in red um, because I think it's been something that we've generally underappreciated in the field, and that is that because we're measuring different endpoints in different ways at different sort of stages of biology, you weren't going to use the same decision-making process. And so we hadn't really thought through how you make decisions out of these, this different kind of a, a way of approaching the problems that we were interested in. And so that had to be a part of this. And there were impacts on cost and time. And, and, and again, another important one of this is getting folks to actually believe in it enough to start using the systems and making decisions, all those kinds of things. So this is the process that we were sort of thinking through as we were engaging this novel technology. So I told you there was going to be a cardiovascular thing in here, and so this is my, my small representation of cardiovascular stuff. So what we did was is that we looked at the full spectrum of ways that, that uh, attrition happens in pharmaceutical development. And in fact, you know, companies have gotten together and we recognize the, the fundamental target organs that cause the most problems. And so we, we, we focused on those problems, and the cardiovascular system is one of them, which is why I could play in my cardiovascular sandbox for most of my, my uh, tenure in pharma. And we started to break it down, right, and understand, well, how, how does the cardiovascular system fail in the context of a drug toxicity? What are the elements of the biology that are important for that? How do we extrapolate from an in vitro to an in vivo setting, all that kind of stuff, because those are the kinds of things that ultimately help you understand what your system should be able to, to replicate. We took that down into increasing levels of detail, and so this particular thing sort of just um, um, frames out a particular part of, so cardiovascular toxicity is not cardiovascular toxicity is not cardiovascular toxicity, right? There's electrophysiology and contracti contractility and vascular injury and valvulopathies and all those kind of stuff. So all of those things had to be thought through, and so this is a representation of how we did that and ultimately used that understanding to try to define what the system would need to look like to be able to model the kinds of things that we were interested in. So just sort of using that progressive process. Once you'd done that, then we had the ability to sort of look at what was available in the context of these systems and try to understand whether they fit the problems we were trying to solve, right? As opposed to, hey, I got this real nifty new hammer, I got to go find a nail. We tried to define the nail and then get the right hammer. And that, that was a bit of a different approach than the way we traditionally do that, because we all get enamored and excited about novel technology, right? You just want to do something with it. Now, we tried to back up the train and sort of do a better job of defining our problems and then try to get the right, um, the right solution to the problem. And so this was another part of that, that progression. Again, uh, a significant part of this was understanding what it took to build confidence in a, in a novel way of working, a novel assay, a novel strategy, all those kinds of things. And so a lot of focus, and, and particularly for the people who develop these kinds of systems, they're always interested in, well, how do I validate this? How do I validate? Tell me what I need to do to validate this, which would you know, encourage you to, to start using it. And we came to recognize that actually validation from an analytical perspective is kind of to some degree, the easy part of all this, right? Because, you know, clinical pathologists and, and uh, clinical laboratory folks do this kind of thing. Assay developers do this kind of thing all the time, right? So we know how to do, you know, a, 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 a interlaboratory reproducibility and sensitivity, specificity, all those kinds of things. The hard part of this 
is actually gaining confidence that, in fact, the data that gets generated in the system has some in vivo relevance. And that's really about the translational qualification. And that's a lot harder to do than the analytical validation. So, and there are elements of things that contribute to that. So that's all stuff that we had to focus on and, and try to build into um, how we engage this, this, this technology. The other part of it was is recognizing that this is going to require investment. In fact, NCATS had already invested um, a few hundred million dollars in, in this effort. Um, that you had to recognize what the value proposition was for all the people who were engaged in it, right? So it wasn't just about us, right? There had to be a value proposition certainly for us. Us is, was pharma at the time. Now I'm interested in the value proposition for what I'm doing now, and I think there is because I've told you that I feel like that this is a gap in our overall uh, toolbox of the way we do modeling. But even the people who develop these, right, it's got to have commercial viability, for them to be able to be successful. And if it doesn't have commercial viability, then it doesn't make any difference how bad I need it or could use it. If it's not available, I can't use it unless I'm going to go build it myself. So you had to sort of talk through and understand what the value propositions were and make sure that there truly was value for all the people who were involved in this. And so that was another part of that, that process. So, so, so that effort, which is, uh, again, a, 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 an area that I'm very interested in. In fact, we're having discussions at NTP about how to build some focus in that particular space. I think it's critical to filling that gap. And that gap, the original gap that I mentioned to you, was this need to understand the transition from adaptive to maladaptive biology in a, in a system that has, the, the, has enough complexity to be able to make a link between the mechanistic kinds of things we traditionally uh, measure and the phenotypic outcomes, at least at the at the tissue or, or organ level, right? So where did all these pieces come together? So I'm going to share um, another set of conversations that we're having where that, that I think could be an exemplar of how we sort of work the paradigm that I've just shared with you. And this is in the context of uh, carcinogenicity testing. So um, I went through the process of applying and being interviewed for and ultimately even being offered a position at NTP that stretched over a, a year because the federal government um, had sort of shut down hiring for a long time. So I was sort of in limbo for uh, several months, which wasn't a problem for me because ultimately it got to a point where I could actually retire from GSK and not just walk away from GSK, which had some financial implications to it. So that was a good thing. Um, but the other part of that was that there were people who knew I was taking the job on before I actually took the job on. And so one of the things I got roped into doing was to give this presentation at Talks Forum back in January. And again, I already confessed to you that I'm not a very smart man. I don't think things through very effectively. And I should I had no business giving this presentation, but I did it anyway. And, and in fact, we've been able to sort of progress this discussion because I think this is an area where there's a lot of interest. Uh, in fact, there's a growing interest in the community to sort of take this challenge on. And I think it's an interesting opportunity to sort of connect some threads that, that I've just shared with you. So I think you all recognize that for a long time, we've recognized that, in fact, you can um, induce um, cancers, tumors, um, in people or animals with certain chemical agents, and, and including in some drugs. And so that's been demonstrated for a long time. And ultimately, this led to um, what was ultimately developed into what the traditional two-year bioassay, right? So for those of you who don't uh, do that kind of work, essentially we take uh, rats and mice and you treat them for two years with whatever your agent of interest. And ultimately that's long enough, that's nearly a complete lifespan for those rodents. And they naturally develop tumors, but, but you can also look for differences in the uh, occurrence of tumors to see if, in fact, you've got a compound or a chemical that has some carcinogenic um, carcinogenic potential to it. And in fact, this is a regulatory expectation in a number of places, including with pharmaceuticals and in some um, chemicals. But again, it's fundamentally based on our recognition that, that in fact, chemicals or pharmaceuticals can induce tumors and that you can replicate that in animal studies. So that was fundamentally based on the confidence that we had that, that animals represent a, a complex mammalian system that's got more commonalities with the human system than they, than they, they don't. We all recognize that, that as a society, we generally don't support the notion of doing experiments in people. And so to, to do them in, in animals is, even though it's challenging, it's something that we have fundamentally accepted. 
Um, the phenotypic outcomes in those studies, the fact that he can see a tumor, the right, the thing that I'm worried about in people uh, enables people to make decisions because they recognize that phenotype and they know what to do with it. There's a historical precedent for having done this and demonstrating that some known carcinogens actually rep uh, replicate those tumors in, in animals and you can do this and in fact it translates. So there's a fair rationale for why we do what we do today. But there's also a pretty good uh, um, value proposition for doing it in a different way, right? Those studies take a lot of animals. They cost a lot of money. Uh, they take a long time. Um, everybody recognizes that animals don't completely recapitulate the human condition. And so there is the potential that, in fact, things that the animal suggests will happen won't actually happen in, 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 um, in people. And so there's a, a good rationale for potentially doing this in a different way. There are some enablers for us to consider it at this time. I think 40 years from now, this probably would have been a hard conversation to have because of our the state of our understanding of carcinogenesis. But I think we know a lot more about carcinogenesis than we did um, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when we first started doing those assays. We know a fair bit of what a carcinogen looks like in the context of a chemical or a pharmaceutical. We've got a whole lot of experience in replicating um, that condition in our animal studies, and that provides a wealth of opportunity for in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. And I think that we've got some opportunity in the context of the modeling platforms that we're developing, in particular the microphysiological systems that I just offered, to start to um, get the complexity of biology that this would entail um, represented in those systems that we didn't have, you know, even 10 years ago. So just as an example, um, you know, there are a number of works that are starting to gain some popularity that, that start to sort of um, 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 highlight what we truly know about carcinogenesis and, and the things that ultimately induce carcinogenesis. So this is an example of one of those. Um, again, some of the key characteristics are, are being more generally accepted. And so we've got a starting point ultimately, right? So it's not like we don't have any sense of what causes carcinogenesis or what a chemical that would induce that would look like. So we've got a place that we can start with um, from that understanding. Again, the wealth of information and, hi and the history that we've got in this particular space, and in fact, this is something that the pharmaceutical company, uh, pharmaceutical industry has been trying to leverage by basically going back and looking at those experiences and, and understanding how you might prioritize what, what pharmaceuticals or drugs really truly do need um, a two-year bioassay. Um, um, by how they performed in some of the subchronic studies that we do. So the moral of that is, is that that um, breadth of experience now allows us to sort of reflect on those learnings and understand how we might do this in a different way. So in that presentation that I gave, I sort of um, um, offered up a bit of a roadmap. And, and I think the most important part of that roadmap is the front part of it, and that is recognizing that if we're going to do carcinogenicity testing in a different way, we we'll probably have a different question that we need to be answering. And um, one of the areas that, I, that I'm interested in, and, and I have, you know, I've thought that, that, that at least in environmental um, toxicology, there's been sort of a, a bit of a biased focus on the, on the two-year bioassay and cancer assessment. You know, and I think there's a lot of other chronic progressive diseases that are much more impactful from a public health perspective that maybe we're not paying enough attention to because we're, we're paying so much attention to this. But it has been pointed out to me that ultimately cancer is the thing that scares folks, right? So that's, and that's a reasonable, a reasonable fear to have. I think we all share that fear. That said, I think there's opportunity for us to, to sort of ask that question in a slightly different way that would give us some opportunity and maybe coming up with an alternative approach to doing that. So in this particular case, I think the carcinogenesis is an exemplar of where we might take that fundamental gap in our ability to predict, use novel technologies to model things in a slightly different way with maybe a slightly different question and ultimately have a significant impact in the way we do at least this part of the business. So with that, and in summary, I think that the NTP has got an incredible history and, and credibility in tackling fundamental challenges in the field of toxicology that largely predates me. So my goal in life is not to screw that up, right, but to actually help them um, to progress into the future. I think the NTP is, is optimally positioned to take on really hard challenges. And you know, the, the challenge that I've, I've tried to advocate to you is this gap in our, in our predictivity. 
I think there's value in us being able to advance that both from an environmental uh, toxicology perspective, but also in pharma in pharmaceuticals. And I, I think that, and this is the thing that, again, I'm, I'm very interested in, is, is it, it's not going to be easy, and it's going to take a lot of collaboration and a, a ultimately a global effort. So with that, I want to acknowledge, um, you know, my GSK colleagues, including Jeff, you know, uh, that I worked with for a long time, the folks I work with in the IQ Consortium, folks I've worked with at FDA, um, and that the team that I have now at, at NTP um, who are not only mentoring me but trying to be patient while I catch up to where you know they've been for for years so um, I appreciate the invite and um, invite any questions at GSK I was really interested in hepatotoxicity, trying to do the same type of work with the same type of thing with hepatotoxicity. Two of the issues that we came that we did. Trying oh, okay. Trying to um, use like screening or in vitro methods to predict in vivo outcomes. One was metabolism and the other one is the immune system. Any, and I haven't done this since I've you know, worked on this in a bit of time. Yep. Uh, are you familiar with any ways that people are trying to address those two issues? So those are two fundamental challenges in the field of uh, the NPS. So the NCATS efforts, and in fact, it continues. So they're into what they call tissue chip 2.0 now. So they've got their next five years of funding out there. And... Um, from the, from the beginning, the intent always was to try to take and start linking organ systems. And the liver was always one of those adjunctive uh, organ systems that everybody was, was interested in, largely for the uh, metabolism component of that. So the problem is, is that uh, as, they, if they, as they've gotten into those building those systems, and, and the, the, they're complex and they're technically challenging. And so it's difficult to start building really complex link systems when the when just the individual organ systems are hard enough by themselves. So, so there are a variety of ways that people are trying to adjust that. One is, is just linking a liver. So you've got liver plus whatever else you're interested in. The other is, is, is ultimately putting things through a, a, a metabolic system and, then, and taking the effluent from that and ultimately passing it through the other system so you get the metabolites as, as a component of that. From an immune system perspective, it's a, it's a similar kind of a thing, right? So they're looking for opportunities to put immune cells in the media of those systems so that you get some of that immune um, component to it. But, but quite honestly, the metabolism and the immune part of all of that are probably the two biggest challenges in any modeling system and even in those complex um, in vitro systems. And I think they're going to remain that way for, for a bit. Because they, they truly are, one, I think they're incredibly influential, right? Because particularly when you start thinking about chronic inflammatory kinds of conditions um, and the, the fundamental um, influence of, of metabolism, but they, they are difficult challenges. But that's, a, that's part of what they're trying to do. And, okay. yeah. Thank you. I appreciate the, 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 the very Kind of a, a challenges you, in, you know, in, indicated about how we do the hazard assessment now, and then yep. how we can get to the better doing it. But I have two questions. One is uh, <clears throat> in related to the uh, uh, cell base in vitro type of assays to you know get a better understanding of you know before you do two year studies. Yep. Uh, but ultimately, um, I think the current stage is that a lot of data that NTP generates that being used by regulatory agencies like FDA, EPA, NIOSH. To, to set up policies or regulations or whatnot. So uh, are they on board to kind of think differently? Because right now, I think most of their uh, assessment processes are based, animal based, you know, the processes. Are the regulators on board? Yes. Yeah. So um, you may be familiar with NICETAM, uh, which is housed within NTP and, and ultimately um, their role with ICVAM. And ICVAM is the interagency coordinating committee for the validation of alternative methods um, and they globally partner with um, with other VAMs that in other countries and so they're actively engaged with uh, regulators to get them to build their confidence 
in using alternative kinds of data. So EPA, for example, has identified a couple of places, skin sensitization, and there's some other eutrotropic assay, I think, that they're gaining confidence in using uh, in vitro alternatives. So I think that that's, that's a challenge. Um, I think that that's um, actively engaging with them. They recognize the need, so they want to believe. I think we just have to be deliberate in how we build confidence. Now, my personal bias is, is that um, this, is, this will be an evolution. And so we're going to continue to do animal studies. And in fact, that's the NTP position. We're going to put effort in to develop those alternative approaches. But animal studies are, are going to continue to be a staple. And so what I want to do is use those animal studies deliberately to help us inform that in vitro to in vivo extrapolation equation so that someday we all have better confidence and being able to have this data and not necessarily need that data. So the regulators are involved in some parts of this process, and I think that they're coming along, but they absolutely see the need. My second question is uh, related to the communication. <clears throat> As a scientist, I mean, we all communicate, you know, what we generate in the science through publications, peer review publication, and so forth. Yeah. But the general public usually not that interested in that stuff, but there's a lot of stuff NTP does based on what, you know, we have done as part of the NTP is the uh, the technical reports that may not get out there anyway. I mean, you have a, a report on carcinogen that comes up yeah. every so many years or so whatnot, yeah. and then you have a EHP, which is a publication that you put out some of that information. Uh, but if you look at the general, you know, public, also people are more skeptical now, kind of, you know, yeah. or distrust, you know, because they hear, even in North Carolina, we have a Gen X issue, we have a cold fly ash issue, you know, climate change issues, yeah. you know, people, so how do we, connect with the people so, at that level? Yeah, I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. So, and it's a, it's a problem on a couple of different levels. One is, is just reporting out the things that we do in, um, in generally understandable language for a non-scientific audience. That's just one thing. The other part of it is actually putting it in some context. And, and that's actually harder, right? So we've got folks looking at our, our uh, web presence and how do we present things in ways that somebody who's not a scientist can actually understand that we're doing stuff in, in what the sense of what that stuff is. Putting it in a, in a context, say, OK, look, you ought to be more worried about this than this it, is, is really, really hard. And particularly for us, because one of the things that, that I think is key to our credibility is doing what we do in a totally unbiased way, right? So we all have opinions about stuff that we see in the data that we generate. But I think it's critical that we don't express those opinions in the context of our role within NTP, because I think as soon as you do that, then you undermine your credibility because somebody's going to see you as biased because you said one thing or another. So I think we have to be, I think we have to be neutral in all this. I think that's part of our credibility. But I also think we need to find out, find ways of being able to contextualize stuff that we do so that somebody gets, recognizes without me having to tell them, hey, look, I really ought to be worried about this. And I know that's potentially bad too, but maybe that's less of a risk to me than this. Because quite honestly, as I've come into this, my seven and a half months at NTB, these guys are scaring the hell out of me, the stuff that we're doing in there. It's like, how the devil does anybody walk outside the door every day because of all the stuff that we're exposed to? So it, it's really challenging to, to try to put some context around that stuff and do it in a way that doesn't bias it one way or the other. And, and I don't have the answer to that, but we're trying to put some focus on that. Yeah, we have a question from our online audience. Uh, they ask, uh, toxins, drugs uh, have effects on physiological systems, organs, but they also may have effects on the brain and behavior, cognition and emotion. How would you propose to integrate behavior, brain effects into the translational strategy that you have proposed? Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things, so I've, I biased this presentation by um, focusing on where I think there's opportunity for innovation in the non-animal space. The reality of it is, is that I think there's opportunity in the animal space too. So, for example, uh, when I was at GSK, the last five years I was there, I headed up a group called Animal Research Strategy, and it was all about looking at critically at how we used animals for both safety and, and pharmacology or efficacy testing to try to understand how to optimize them for translation. And there are, there are, are drug development spaces that, that companies have moved away from because of that challenge in understanding like psychiatry drugs and pain drugs and all those kinds of things that animal models haven't been really good at, uh, at modeling for us. 
And there's some interesting technology developing that, that I think gives us a better opportunity to evaluate behavior in animals outside of the traditional swim test and the kinds of things that neurobehavioral kinds of folks, no critique of the neurobehavioral kinds of folks, but I think that we need to look um, more critically at sort of changes in natural behaviors in those animals to get better sense of those kinds of effects. So I'm saying that to say, I think that is a place where animals are still gonna play a, a critical role because I don't have a good sense of how you model those kinds of things in a, in a non-animal kind of a system. But I think we need to, to get better at, at the kinds of endpoints and the way we measure those kinds of effects in, in animals because I don't think the current systems do a very good job. So the, the bottom line there is, even though I've, uh, I, I spent most of this time talking about things I think we ought to do in the non-animal space, we have interest in actually looking critically at our animal studies and trying to understand how to optimize them too. Again, recognizing that they're going to be a part of our, our uh, toolbox for the foreseeable future. Uh, do you think the uh, in vivo studies would uh, better represent uh, population diversity? So another area, that's a good question. So um, those of you who are familiar with animal studies have recognized that in the interest of coming up with uh, um, clear outcomes, we've made our animal studies and our animals pretty artificial, right, by sort of moving away from variability because it, because you know, in, in an interest in not using huge numbers of animals and again getting clear outcomes, all that kind of stuff, we have uh, an effort looking at the uh, diversity outbred uh, mouse models to try to understand how you bring genetic diversity into a study that is more representative of the human condition and be able to sort of read through, for lack of better terminology, the noise that that brings to get to get a more translationally relevant kind of a. Um, context for those kinds of things. So we're, we're working with that and trying to understand how to, how to do that. I, uh, I really liked your pathobiology predictive scale where it goes from normal to maladaptive pathology. Um, I guess thinking about the U.S. population and exposure to different carcinogens, is there an effort to develop um, in silico or uh, in vitro models that represent um, more of public health. Um, for example, uh, about 30% of the population is overweight. Uh, we have a yeah. really large aging population. Or are you more interested in just recap recapitulating the animal work before you start moving into some of these disease models? So th that's a good question. And I. Um... And in my confessions early on about why I should never have did this, that's part of it. And in fact, even in pharma, we used to occasionally get into some discussion and recognize that, that you know, we weren't fairly representing the real context that most of our drugs are going because of metabolic disease and all those kinds of things. But, you know, as a community, we've shied away from trying to integrate those kinds of things into our animal studies because, you know, the complexity of how well that, you know, you know all those things. I actually think that that's, that's, that's an area that I think is a, is, a, is a driver for getting more mechanistic data so that we can contextualize it better, right? So, for example, if I, if I knew that a chemical, it was altering lipid metabolism, I'm not entirely sure that I need to replicate that in an animal to recognize that in a, in a, in a population with dyslipidemia or metabolic disease, that's probably not a good thing. But so I, I think that as we understand human disease better and we get better insights into the, the, the biological mechanisms, mechanisms or modes or however you like to think about that, that the, 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 the chemicals or drugs induce, I think we have a, a better ability to sort of virtually put them together. Because I think if we set out to try to model them, I think it would be a black hole. And I think that's why, as a community, we've shied away from doing that. But I think we absolutely have to get better. At, again, this is all about context, right? It, because we're, we're modeling these things in fairly normal systems, even though even the animals aren't completely normal. But we haven't had as much genetic diversity as we should have. 
we haven't had the, uh, the understanding of, of how those, that bio, that bioactivity uh, would play out in a, in a metabolically drained system, all those kinds of stuff. So I'm saying all that to say that I think that the opportunity is, is us getting a better understanding of, of, of the, bio, the mechanistic bioactivity of the chemicals or drugs we're interested in and putting that in the context about what we understand about human disease and making some judgments about whether we think that's going to be a bad thing or not. Now, that was a whole lot easier for me to say that than it, and even though it was challenging for me to say that, than to actually do it. But I think that's the, the opportunity. Uh, to, to build off that last discussion, so I, I really like the, your box slide. Um, <laughs> You're the only one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and I also really appreciate all the work that's going on in NTP to actually operationalize all of those boxes. That's mm -hmm. no small feat. Um, but I, I found it interesting that kind of in your top left, I guess, you had uh, mine existing literature or yeah. mine current knowledge, and your feedback went into mining. But then a couple of slides later, you were talking about AOPs and, and kind of, you know, formalizing the understanding. And it seems like you've got, you know, this, this very systematic approach to understanding the mechanisms that, you know, it'd be good to kind of codify that, you know, you're, you're not now mining. That's, that's real information, and, it, yeah. and it's already organized for you. And, you know, how much are you leveraging the AOP pathway and that, that type of... So the AOP framework, is, uh, is one that is uh, an active part of the whole alternative space, right? And I think they've probably done the best job of, of taking that framework, raising its visibility, and actually actively trying to build those kinds of things. Um, I confess to you that as a pathologist, it, it's a natural way of thinking because, you know, that's the way I learned pathogenesis, and so it, it just comes natural to me. There are folks who are concerned about um, the linearity of some of those adverse outcome pathways and the fact that, you know, particularly when you get into the sort of adaptive, maladaptive, right, there's lots of different ways some of those molecular initiating events go that is oversimplified in the context of an AOP. But at least it gives you some sense of the events that lead from point A to point B. And again, it's given me an opportunity to say, look, I think we got a gap right here because this is a bit that we're not modeling. So ultimately, that 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 information and the data that we generate that sort of overlays that information is, is what ultimately will feed into that iterative learning process. So all of those things are feeding into that. And in fact, the iterative error that I have wasn't actually intended to point just to that box, but in, in fact, that, that whole spectrum of, of possibilities, right? The basic bioactivity screening, the QSAR modeling, the, the mining knowledge, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, the point really is is to integrate all those pieces and understand how they sort of fit together and define the, the framework that you kind of carry through that entire process. Super. Well, I appreciate, uh, again, the invite. It was great to come here and uh, see this incredible this building of you all. So 